Amazing. Thank you so much, CC, for that Bible reading. And good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to St. John's. If we've not met yet, my name is Graham. I'm the vicar of the church, uh, and it's great to see so many of us here today at uh, this September, this beginning of a new school and academic year. Uh, I mean, often when we get to January, we make New Year's resolutions, don't we? But I don't know about you. Often when I get back from holiday in August, I always have a, a nice, decent holiday in August to rest and get refreshed, ready for the new academic year. And often the beginning of September marks a time of making some new resolutions, thinking about getting things back on track uh, with my diet, with my sleep, uh, with my disciplines, all of those sorts of things. And um, I want to sort of begin with a little bit of a disclaimer uh, today, or, or perhaps even a little reminder or a, a, a paradigm or a prism through which we might think about what happens uh, when we gather together here at church. Some of you remember that about six months ago, I had surgery and I had um, a, a hip operation. Uh, and after I'd recovered from the surgery, I began a course of physiotherapy. Has anybody here ever had physiotherapy after an injury or surgery? Yeah two or three or four people, maybe more. I suspect many of us have had some course of physiotherapy at some stage or another. Um, if your experience of physiotherapy is anything like mine, you go to the physiotherapist full of great intentions about how you're going to listen to their instructions and diligently and dutifully go home and do the uh, exercises regularly and frequently just as you are instructed. And the physiotherapist will tell you that your recovery is entirely dependent on how well you stick to the program and stick to the plan. Uh, maybe some of you have experienced that. I certainly have. Now, I was really keen to get back to being able to run and play football, so I have tried to be fairly disciplined with the physiotherapy. But I've had to go to my physio a couple of times and say, I'm really sorry, this last three weeks I just got overwhelmed by work and I didn't do the exercises. And, you know, he knows that not every patient is going to obediently and faithfully perform all of their exercises, but all he can do is remind me and say, well, if you want to achieve your goals, if you want to reach your aspirations, this is how. Now, in happy news, I went to my physiotherapist this week, and he said, I'm really happy with your progress, you're doing great, and he signed me off, uh, and I don't need to go back to see him. I've got a little program, and I began a new running program, and in a couple of months, I should be back playing football. So praise God, recovery is going well, and that's all good. But you know, when we come together in church, part of my role, part of the role of those of who, uh, us who preach and who teach uh, in the church is to try and be a bit of a physiotherapist to you for your soul. Um, I can tell you what sort of practices and disciplines and what sort of uh, insights from Scripture will help you grow in your faith, will help you become more like Jesus. It's up to you to decide whether you're going to put that into practice or not. Does that make sense? It, it, it's also like a nutritionist. A nutritionist might well tell you what diet you should follow if you want to, your body to stay healthy. Now, that doesn't mean that every nutritionist has a perfect diet. Some nutritionists might binge out on some snacks from time to time. And in the same way, just because I or Besede or Sarah or Daniel or any of the other kind of teachers and preachers in this church sometimes offer an instruction or some guidance on how to live uh, the way of Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that we're perfect and that we're doing it perfectly every time. Often, when I'm preparing a sermon, I'm preaching to myself and thinking, my goodness, Jesus, I want to be more like this. I want to live up to the words I'm speaking. But I offer that just as a sort of disclaimer and a reminder that sometimes in our teaching and our preaching, we're going to be encouraging you to enter into a way of life that follows Jesus that will be good for your soul, that will be good for your mind, that will be good for your body, that will be good for your relationships. And none of us are doing this to heap judgment on you and wag a finger if you're not doing it very well. We're like the physiotherapist or the nutritionist or the doctor who says, you know, here's the diagnosis, here's my prescription. If you go and do these things, I, I think it will go well with you. So Father, we pray that um, you would speak in this church to each of us, that by your spirit you would speak words of life that by your spirit, our hearts and our minds would be open to hear and receive what you have for us. And that each of us would be changed. 
Lord, when we gather in church, we don't want to just go through the motions. We want to be changed and become more like you so that we might shine as lights in the world, so that we might receive and experience life in all its fullness, so that we might know the comfort of Jesus, our Savior, coming alongside us. So, Lord, give us ears to hear, hearts uh, to receive what you have for us. Make us willing to obey, and by your Spirit, give us the power uh, to act upon those uh, intentions that we set. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, on a similar theme, I wonder how you're doing with your streaks. Is anybody on a streak at the moment? Yeah? Duolingo? Anyone doing Duolingo? No? That's fine. Neither am I anymore. (laughs) Um, For two months, Sarah and I were dutifully doing Duolingo every day because we were going on holiday to Italy, and I'm always a bit embarrassed about those English tourists, British tourists, who go on holiday to Europe and don't bother to learn any other language and just speak slower and louder. So I like to try and enter into the culture and the language of the place I am, at least uh, to some degree. So what was our streak? We maybe got to, what did you get, 48, 50? 65, Sarah got a 65 day streak on Duolingo. I don't think I did that well, but I did get a streak freeze from time to time that allowed me, if I'd missed a day or or done Duolingo after midnight, to to keep it running. Uh, Anybody here use Snapchat? No, they're all at the vicarage. Yes, (laughs) one person uses Snapchat. My children, my kids who are all teenagers, they all use Snapchat with their friends. Uh, And I was chatting with one of them this week about his streak. And and Snapchat uses streaks to try and encourage regular communication between friends. And if you send a picture or a message every day to a friend, you'll get on a streak. And that will show you. I can't remember what I was told was their longest streak. But it'll be be a, a real reminder that every day for the last 200 days, 300 days, you've had some communication with this friend, this person. Anybody use the YouVersion Bible app? Yes, a few of us. So I've made it my discipline to um, read the verse for the day as the first thing I do every morning. So that whatever else happens in the day, I've had a little moment of scripture uh, at the beginning of the day. Um, And I'm quite pleased with how my streaks are going. I'll t- I'll t- I don't know, I'm not going it's, it's not a brag because some of you, so you, we could have like an auction. Maybe some will like reveal amazing things. I'll tell you the two days every year that I normally lose my streak are Christmas Day and uh, Focus Pack Up Day. <laughs> They're the two days of the year when my alarm goes off and I'm hurried into action. Uh, by the kids coming in with their stockings on Christmas Day or by a brutal early alarm and the need to get up and get packing so that we can get the van loaded up from focus and and, and ready to go. Those are the two days that most years I lose my streak. But just at the moment, I'm on a 623-day streak. Is that right? Higher? Anyone? Higher? (laughs) And, And you know... That's not because I do a deep dive into the scripture every morning. It's not that I'm spending loads of time in prayer and meditation on scripture every morning. I'm not. I'm usually thinking about the coffee that I want and getting some toast and what I'm going to have to do in the day. But it is a discipline to try and say at the beginning of every day, Lord, I'm following you. And I, and I, I, I live not on bread alone, but on every word which comes from the Father's mouth. And, and just a moment, just a few moments of reflection and prayer. It's it's been said that it takes 40 days of doing something consistently to develop a habit. I always think that's quite interesting that the period of fasting in Lent for Christians, it's actually 46 days, and some people break their fast on the Sundays because there are six Sundays in the period of Lent. Some people fast all the way through. But whatever way, actually, if you do create a new discipline for 40 days, it's likely, it's more manageable to incorporate that as a daily habit give something up for 40 days, 50 days, you'll probably get to the end and think, I don't need it again. If, if, if you really want to change your life, uh, that's one of the ways uh, it works. It's also been said that you never change your life until you change something you do every day. We're creatures of 
habit. Think about the Paralympians that we've been watching on our TVs or the musicians performing in the proms this autumn. It takes dedication and practice for them to achieve their goals. Most of us, certainly I, don't have their levels of dedication and self-discipline. And in fact, it's also well documented that there's often a gap between um, our aspirations and our intentions on the one hand and our actual actions and patterns of behavior on the other. Sometimes this is described as espoused values versus operative values. What we like to say about who we are, what our aspirations and intentions for who we are and what we do and how we live are, and what's actually going on beneath the waterline. Sometimes it's visualized like an iceberg, like the iceberg that sank the Titanic. And what you see above the waterline is only a tiny fraction. And there's this huge thing that the operative values of how we live that are below the waterline that are actually uh, giving us uh, force and, and motivation. Culture eats vision for breakfast, they say. Who you are is really a sum total of what you do. That's known as Aristotle's virtue ethic. If you want to be a kind person, do kind things repeatedly. If you want to be a generous person, be generous repeatedly in your actions, and it, it will make you into that kind of person. And for the next four weeks here at St. John's, we're going to try and explore some of the values uh, which we hope shape our culture here at St. John's Hoxton. Now, vision is important, and we very easily forget why we're here. And so it's quite important that we remind ourselves why we're here in, in God's purposes, uh, in God's plan. Why does he have us here? And our vision here at St. John's is to be a beacon of hope for Hoxton. Um, and that means that we're very much focused on uh, bringing the good news of God's kingdom into this neighborhood so that everybody, every man, woman, and child of whatever different background, culture, ethnicity, age, whatever it might be, can experience the goodness of God's kingdom in their midst. And we hope and pray that when they experience the goodness of God's kingdom, they will want to find out who the king is. And, and at that point, we invite them to Alpha and to church and all those sorts of things. It, one way that I like to describe this vision to be a beacon of hope for Hoxton is to look at 2 Corinthians 5.19. It's a Bible verse that for me uh, motivates and inspires everything I do in this church. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their sins against them. And he's entrusted this ministry of reconciliation to us. So it's the role, the responsibility, the duty, the calling, the vocation of every local church to be a place in which people can experience the ministry of reconciliation. They might experience that in hearing the message of forgiveness of sins by Jesus' death and resurrection, the healing, the salvation that it offers and brings and puts into effect. They might experience the ministry of reconciliation through finding greater justice, social justice, greater relational harmony in the way we live and, and work in our neighborhood. Either way, people are experiencing the ministry of reconciliation. It's important, it's central uh, to, to why we are here, that we remind ourselves of that. But how we do it is also important. And we have four values that we've adopted as a church over the years to try and describe how we operate, how, how, what, what are the operative values, how we function, how, how we do things here at St. John's. And, and they are these four, rooted, uh, that we are responsive, that we are relational, and that we are risk-taking. That we're rooted, we're rooted in the historic Christian faith handed down uh, and relayed to us through scripture. That we're rooted in the traditions of the Church of England. That we're rooted in this particular place and context and neighborhood. We're responsive, we're responsive to the gifts that God brings into our midst. Anyone who comes and gathers and makes himself part of this church family has a gift, a calling, a, a part to play. And we want to be responsive to that. And if we need to tweak and adjust what we do so there's a space for your gift to be put into practice and for you to shine, then we'll do that. We're also responsive to need. If we suddenly discover that there's local need around us that we want to uh, respond to, we'll, we'll say, Lord, how can we serve the needs of our neighborhood? We want to be responsive. We want to be relational in everything we do. This is the hardest part of the values, I think, for us to hold together. Because relationships take time. And we're Londoners, and Londoners don't like taking time. 
Well, Londoners are always busy. Londoners are always over-scheduled, over-committed, over-stretched, overwhelmed. But relationships take time. You've got to go have coffee with people, chat with people, eat with people, pray with people, listen to people. We're usually too busy thinking about our own schedules, our own tasks, our own agendas to actually listen to people. And that's why we need some practices to help us develop relationships. Sarah's going to be talking about developing a relational culture in a couple of weeks' time. And then finally, we're risk-taking. We're not afraid to try things. We're not afraid to adapt if we think that God is opening a door or making a way. Those are the four values that we try to, to see as our kind of operating system. And today, I want to think a little bit about what it means to be rooted. Rooted. I've said that the way we articulate that in our mission action plan is to say we're, we're rooted in the historic Christian faith, which we've received through the apostles' teaching, through the scriptures, uh, through the church, through the ages. We're rooted in a particular set of relationships and practices in the Church of England. We have a particular inheritance. And part of that particular inheritance in the Church of England is we're rooted in our place, in our context. We believe that God has called us to be here for Hoxton. Like, I'm not doing evangelism in Oval. I'm not running connect groups in Hammersmith. Because that's not my calling. That's the calling of other churches in those places. We're here for this neighborhood, this place. I understand and appreciate that, of course, because of the way things are in London, there'll be people who are joining us online even now who are not in Hoxton, but somehow have some affinity, some care, some concern for this neighborhood, and, and you've united yourselves with us as a church and in prayer, and perhaps in service in other ways. And I know that when we gather together on any Sunday, there'll be people visiting London, people new to London, people who are not sure whether they're going to be rooted in Hoxton for a long time. And that's okay, you're welcome. We love having you with us. None of us are here forever, but while we are here, we are here for this neighborhood. But to be rooted is about our connectedness to these things. How do we feel connected to that historic Christian faith that we receive in Scripture? How do we feel connected uh, in the Church of England and the particular traditions? And how do we feel connected in our place? And I want to focus today mainly on how we can be rooted in historic Christian faith, what you might just call the way of Jesus, the way of Jesus that has endured through the ages. Because the point of being a Christian, if you are a Christian, is to follow Jesus in the way that he leads, to follow Jesus into everlasting life, to receive and experience life in all its fullness, to follow Jesus into sacrificial death, into laying down your life for the sake of others, to follow into transformation, to be conformed to his likeness. And the trouble for us is that too often we don't actually want Jesus to be the leader that we follow, we want him to be a walking companion on the course that we've set. How do we stay connected and rooted in this way of Jesus? How do we let Jesus be our guide and our leader? And our passage today suggests that there are three key aspects that we need to think about. We need to think about how we remain with Jesus, and we need to think about how we obey Jesus and how we love like Jesus. And I'm going to talk a bit more about how we remain with Jesus and then briefly about how we obey Jesus and love like Jesus. And one of the books that's helped me a lot in the last year that I want to encourage everybody here who's able to, to get a hold of and read is this book by John Mark Comer called Practicing the Way. And he's summarizing really the whole of Christian life as being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and learning to do what Jesus did, doing the things that Jesus did. It's a great course corrective for us if we find that Jesus is following us rather than we following him. It's really easy to read. It's quite simply set out. And actually, there's a course that accompanies it. Um, we had a connect group that meets in our home uh, that looked at this earlier on in the year. It was so helpful. And I'll say a little bit more later on. There are um, also some practices that he commends for helping us get into this way of Jesus. And I'm quite keen this term to see if there's a group of people who'd like to learn more about and put into practice some of these practices. So maybe if you're interested in that, you can speak to me. And if we find and form a little group, we can do that together. 
But let's begin by thinking about how Jesus invites us to remain in him. Jesus uses the image of a vine and branches to describe his relationship with his disciples and how this relationship benefits the disciples, how it benefits us. By remaining in the vine, that is being rooted in Jesus, we bear fruit. It's no secret that I enjoy a glass of wine, and uh, any of you who know me well uh, will know that one of my favorite places to visit in the world is the south of France, or maybe the southwest of France, in those regions where they grow grapes by the millions. And as you drive through the countryside, every field is laid out with neat vines and beautifully clad with vines and leaves and clusters of grapes. I love nothing more than wandering around through the vines, maybe picking a grape to taste, and then maybe tasting the grapes a little later in the process uh, in the evening. But one of the things I've come to learn is that the health of the vine, the connectedness of the vine, is critical to its ability to bear fruit, to yield fruit. And there's a, a warning, by contrast, from Jesus, that if we're not rooted, if we're not connected to Jesus, we will not bear fruit. In fact, we will wither and die. A couple of years ago, um, the clematis in our back garden had overgrown. It had become too big, too strong, and it was actually tearing down the fence. The fence was literally toppling under its weight. And it got a bit out of control, and we didn't really know what to do. Uh, So I did that ultimate gardening hack and took a pair of secateurs and just cut off a few of the branches from the source. And what happened? They withered and died. And within a few months, they had dried out, they were brown, and it was much easier, they were much lighter, it was much easier to pull them out and burn them. That which remained rooted began to put out new shoots, new tendrils, and grew again. So how do we remain or abide in the vine as branches, disciples, followers of Jesus? I want to read an extract from this book to you. Uh, Again, I commend it to you, but I've got it here on the iPad. So John Mark Comer writes about this remaining in the book, uh, practicing the way. And he's talking about this passage, and he says, Jesus gave a teaching that is essentially a tutorial on how to be with him. You could title it, Jesus' Model of Spiritual Formation. He used the metaphor of a winery and the need for a branch to abide in the vine to bear much fruit. And in this metaphor, Jesus is the vine and we, his apprentices, are the branches. Then he gave this instruction, abide in me and I in you. And the word for abide is meno in Greek. It could be translated remain or stay or dwell or make your home in. We could translate the verse this way, make your home in me as I make my home in you. Jesus uses this word, meno, not once, but 10 times in this short teaching. Go read it. Actually, I'm just pause and break off. I think he uses it 11, but I'm going to go and double check. You can have a count later on. Uh, He's driving to a singular point. Make your home in my presence by the Spirit and never leave. Now, if this sounds like the purview of monks and nuns, not the rest of us who are busy raising kids or living in a city or responsible for an inbox. Let me clarify. Jesus isn't asking you to do something you're not already doing. All of us are abiding. The question isn't, are you abiding? It's, what are you abiding in? All of us have a source that we are rooted in, a kind of default setting that we return to, an emotional home. It's where our minds go when they're not busy with tasks, where our feelings go when we need solace where our bodies go when we have free time, where our money goes after we pay the bills. We will make our home somewhere. The question is, where? And this matters because whatever we abide in will determine the fruit of our lives for good or for ill. So he continues. He says, if we are rooted in the infinite scroll of social media, it will form us, likely into people who are angry, anxious, arrogant, simplistic and distracted. If we are rooted in the endless queues of our streaming platforms of choice, Netflix, Prime, Sky, Disney, 
they will form us too, likely into people who are lustful, restless, and bored, never present to what is. If we are rooted in the pursuit of hedonism, another drink, another toke, another hookup to take the edge off the pain and let us find a moment's peace, that, that will form us as well, likely into people who are compulsive, addictive, and running from our pain, and simultaneously our healing. But if we are rooted in the inner life of God, that will also form us. It will slowly grow the fruit of the Spirit in our life. Apprenticeship to Jesus is about turning your body into a temple, a place of overlap between heaven and earth, an advanced sign of what one day Jesus will do for the entire cosmos when heaven and earth are at long last reunited as one. This is the single most extraordinary opportunity in the entire universe to let your body become God's home. And it's set before you every day. Jesus called this way of life abiding. But the saints and the sages have used all sorts of language down through history to capture the extraordinary possibility of this invitation. It's a, it's a long quote, but I wanted to share it with you because it's a central uh, claim of the book. And I think one of the most helpful insights of this passage is to acknowledge that all of us are already abiding somewhere. We're all rooted in some story of our existence. And the issue for us is whether we can develop the brutal uh, self-honesty about what habits are forming or deforming us. Where really do you spend your time? Where really do you spend your money? What ambitions or aspirations really drive you? What fears or anxieties are you trying to uh, sort of push and hold at bay? If we're honest enough to recognize that our social media feed or our career aspirations or our desire for money and the stuff that it can buy or uh, the particular sets of relationships that we become dependent on, they're really shaping our daily habits and behaviors. Then we can start to ask the question of what kind of counter habits or alternative practices we might need if we want to stay rooted in Jesus. Again, John Mark Comer carries on in the book to mention uh, nine practices that he thinks uh, and, and the team around him thinks are core, and this is learning from the early church as well, and the church through history, core to thinking of, to developing a good, healthy rhythm of life that follows the way of Jesus. And he commends nine core practices, and I'm not going to stop and pause on them just now, but as I said, if you're interested in learning more about these, come and speak to me, because maybe we can put together a little learning group uh, to get together online and, and read and think and pray and learn, and then put them into practice. He talks about Sabbath, you know, taking a, a, a proper rest period every week in obedience to God's command, and maybe a Sabbath even for your phone and computer and other things. He talks about solitude the need to take ourselves away just to spend time with God, not always being distracted uh, by the fuss and clutter of people around us. He talks about the practice of prayer, developing a rhythm of prayer that will enable us to listen to God and to talk to God. He talks about the practice of fasting, something that some of us practice regularly, some of us practice during Lent and Advent, um, but really a lost practice of Christian faith, something that until the last couple hundred years ago was absolutely assumed that every Christian would do, but many of us now don't. We live in a gluttonous age, so fasting feels like a complete uh, heresy in that age. He talks about the practice of reading Scripture, and we do get to hear Scripture read in church every Sunday. So if you come to church on Sunday, at the very minimum, you will hear the Bible read once a week. And if you can keep your ears tuned in and pay attention, you know that at the very minimum, you've heard God speaking through Scripture once a week. But if we can develop the practice of reading the Bible every day, even just for one verse, even just for a short moment of prayer and meditation, um, start where you are. If you're not reading the Bible at all in the week, try and read one verse a day. Don't try and start with a 30-minute Bible study or quiet time. Just start little. But then find a way to get into a group where you can read Scripture together and learn together. He talks about the practice of community. And I want to read to you just quickly what he says here. Uh, on, on the practice of community, John Mark Homer says, John Ortberg has observed we generally sin alone, but we heal together. Or as they say in AA, I get drunk, we stay sober. Make sense? We generally sin alone, but our healing needs to come in community. Or as they say in AA, we repeat it, I get drunk, we stay sober. 
John Mark Comer continues, says, the church is where we are re-parented into the family of God. It's scary because it regularly goes wrong. Examples abound. Our deepest wounds come from relationships, and yet so does our deepest healing. We simply are not meant to follow Jesus alone. The radical individualism of Western culture is not only a mental health crisis and a growing social catastrophe, it's a death blow to any kind of serious formation into Christ-like love, because it's in relationships that we are formed and forged. From coming together on Sunday for worship, to eating a meal around a table, to practicing confession, to entering into spiritual direction, therapy, mentorship, community is how we travel the way together. He goes on to talk about generosity as a practice, about service as a practice, serving in your local church, serving in your community, being generous with your resources, sharing what you have to meet the needs. He talks about the practice of witness, uh, bearing witness to what God has done. And um, another author uh, called Ian Paul has written a very short and readable book on developing an evangelical spirituality, or in simpler terms, forming a biblical pattern of Christian living. And, and he similarly identifies seven key practices. He talks about being changed or converting, conversion, um, being changed. He talks about gathering as the people of God, as we do Sunday by Sunday uh, or in our midweek groups. He talks about the importance of reading scripture, listening to what God has to say. He talks about the centrality of prayer, of fasting, of sharing. Again, being generous with our resources, sharing what we have, our money, our gifts, our time. Uh, and about serving, serving in our community, serving on the kids team, on the welcome team, serving in a midweek ministry or group. You can see that quite a lot of these things overlap. The key insight is that we can't do all of these practices alone because there's no app and no YouTube channel or morning routine to fulfill all of these. Maybe you want to do an exercise program, you know, Pilates or calisthenics, and maybe there's a YouTube channel which gives you a 20-minute tutorial that you can do in your bedroom by yourself. That's fine. But actually, you can't have a shared community meal by yourself, by definition. You can't serve in the needs of your community by yourself, by definition. You can't gather together at the Lord's table as the family of God by yourself, by definition. It's impossible. You can't do that sharing of your resources to bless others, giving money away, giving time, giving gifts, giving attention. You can't do that by yourself, by definition. It's only by being rooted in certain relationships to one another in the church that we can fulfill generous sharing, gathering in community, serving others. Now, there's a bit of a reality check for all of us in this. The patterns of attendance and engagement in our church at the moment mean that many people in our church family only gather here once a month. If that. Some more, some less. Many of the members of our church come late to church and miss the opportunity to worship God in song, miss the opportunity to experience the joy of repentance and confession, and hearing again the absolution of our sins. Many of our church are not serving on a team to help support uh, our common life together. Indeed, at the moment, we might have to cancel some of the kids' ministry because we just don't have enough people who are willing to serve and help. But actually, we, we believe that there are enough of us. There, are, there, there, there should be. But we, it's that commitment to being in there and that, that practice of serving Many in our church family are not really sharing their resources as they could. They're not participating in the financial giving that's going to make them more generous people and is going to help develop our common life and our mission. Now, look, this is not me wagging the finger at you. All of us have experienced that at some stage or another in our lives. This is me in physiotherapist mode, saying if you want to be well, if you want to develop in your Christian life, if you want to become stronger in your faith, in following the way of Jesus, here are some things that you can do up to you whether you do the exercises or not. Maybe you're one of those, maybe you're not. I suspect that because you're here, you're not. But it is good to do a little personal inventory from time to time and say, how am I doing? What am I actually doing? I've been thinking about my prayer life. I want to be more intentional about my prayer life this autumn. And so I'm going to try and form a prayer partnership or a prayer triplet again. I've been in one in the past, I'm not in one at the moment. But I want to do that 
Because actually, if I don't make myself accountable to somebody else, I might not pray as I want to. Make sense? The good news is that once you've had that honest reflection on where you are, it's relatively easy to convert. You pray about your rootedness, you figure out what, which of these practices you want to adopt, you decide, and then you act. But my only warning to you comes in the form of a riddle. Ten frogs were sitting on a wall, and nine decided to jump off. How many frogs were sitting on the wall? Anyone? No, not one. Ten. Because deciding is not doing. Ten frogs were sitting on a wall. Nine decided to jump off. How many were sitting on the wall? Ten. Because deciding is not doing. Until you've put your intention into action, you are still living that gap between the espoused value and the operative value. Make sense? Convert your intention to action. Does any of this really matter, you might ask? Well, Jesus reminds us. These are his words. He says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up thrown into the fire and burned. But, these are Jesus' words, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The glory of God is that we might bear spiritual fruit, revealing Christ to the world by showing ourselves as his faithful followers. And what we wish and what we desire when we remain in him, his glory, his goodness in our lives, his provision, life in all its fullness, these wishes and desires that will form in us as we remain, abide, dwell with Jesus, they are promised us if we will remain with him. I mean, I'd say it's a gamble you can't lose. It's the best investment you could ever make in your life. Because what you wish and what you desire when you remain, when you abide, when you dwell with Jesus will be his glory, his goodness, his goodness manifest in your life. What you wish and you desire will be to become more like him. And he promises that all this will happen if you remain in him. I'm not going to talk about the other two things that I had prepared because we spent enough time on that. I just wonder, how's your streak going? What, what are the streaks in your life that are occupying your daily attention, your daily habits, your daily behaviors? Are they streaks which lead to life? Or are they streaks that lead to you know, distraction, or chaos, or all kinds of other things? I said at the beginning that this talk might be a little bit like the kind of relationship I would have with my physiotherapist where he says do these exercises and you'll get strong and healthy it will be well with your body and I have to go away and figure out whether I can carve out the time and discipline myself enough to do it what my physiotherapist doesn't do he he tells me the exercise to do what my physiotherapist doesn't do is come and knock on the door at 7.30 each morning and say I've got 20 minutes to spare should we do this together I mean I'm sure if I had enough money I could pay somebody to do that He doesn't do that. It's it's left to me. But that's not how it is with Jesus. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit to come alongside us, the paraclete, the advocate, the one who comes alongside us. And actually, all of us, if we are relying just on our self-will, our self-determination, are going to struggle. But if we will open ourselves to him and ask that the Holy Spirit give us the power, the will, to remain in Jesus, to be rooted, to to pursue these practices, then I believe that by his grace and by his power, we will be changed, we will be transformed for his glory. Would you like to stand if you're able to? And let's pray for the Holy Spirit to come and rest on each of us and be among us.
Father, it's my hope and prayer that you will have given us collectively a vision of how we can abide, dwell, and remain in Christ and he in us this morning. I thank you that you have refreshed my own personal vision of what it means to be connected and rooted in this church, in these relationships, and I pray that will be the same for others. But Father, I cannot do this without your Holy Spirit. My disciplines of prayer, my disciplines of service, my desire to be generous, my desire to be in relationship, to be connected. I will be pulled away and distracted by, by TV, by busyness, by emails, by social media, by my own laziness and sloth, by my appetites and interests. I cannot do it without your Holy Spirit. And Father God, what, I, what is true for me, I believe is true for each of us. So I pray now that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon uh, these your people, this your family, this your body. And even now that your Holy Spirit would be uh, working in our hearts, working in our minds, changing our desires, bending our wills to make us obedient to yours. And just in the next minute, in the silence, I just want to invite you to invite the Holy Spirit in, to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you and confirm for you what your response should be today. What is your response? Come Holy Spirit, speak to your people.